Like most of you, I was raised on the King James Version of the Bible. Much of its stately language still appeals to me and moves me greatly, but some of it sounds a bit stuffy, actually very stuffy, and in need of updating in order to be heard well by our contemporary ears. I've been really delighted by some of the more modern versions of the Bible, and I usually offer the scripture from one of them. Today, our scripture is from the eighth chapter of the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament, where wisdom is personified as a woman speaking urgently to humanity about how to live wisely. Although I included only part of the chapter in the bulletin, I invite you to read the first part of the chapter when you have about two minutes. Because the translations of the entire eighth chapter in the Living Bible and in Eugene Peterson's Message Bible are so robust, I've adapted them here, and I hope you'll enjoy this fresh take on an interesting scenario. It goes like this. Can you hear the voice of Lady Wisdom? She is standing at the city gates and at every fork in the road and at the door of every house. Listen, people, she calls out, listen to me for I have important information for you. If your minds are ready for truth, you will see that nothing is more valuable than wisdom, for it leads us to God knowledge and to the disciplines of good judgment and, ju and justice and direction and discretion and rightness, instead of to a life squandered in chasing after money and lucrative careers. Everyone who searches for me will find me. You may not have known this, but God created me before God created anything else, even before the oceans and the earth and the mountains and the heavens. I, in, fa in fact, I was there when God made the blueprints for creation. I was the craftswoman at his, at his side, constantly delighting and rejoicing in God's presence and applauding God for everything that was created, the wide world and the human family. Anyone who is eager to be with me and watches for me every day in the places where I live will be happy and will find real life. Here ends the reading of the lesson. Words of life for all whose ears are inclined to hear them. And together we say, thanks be to God. <clears throat> thank you for being here, and thank you for letting me be here. Let's be together for a moment in prayer or meditation. God of many names, whose highest name and form is human love, Thank you for all the people gathered here in person and in their homes, and thank you for this church. Open our minds and our hearts to wise and courageous living, and be a steady presence for us during these days of uncertainty and great change. Amen. On June 14th, my spouse Sylvia dropped me off at Denver International Airport so I could catch a flight for a quick trip back to Houston to see a few old friends. Alas, that was one of the several days that Southwest Airlines had a massive system failure. And to make a long story short, my flight, which was scheduled to arrive in Houston around 3 p.m., was canceled as we were all standing in line to board it. I was involuntarily rebooked on another nonstop that would not have gotten in until 10 p.m., then rebooked again and actually boarded a flight that stopped in Tucson and eventually got to Houston around 9 p.m. My suitcase did not arrive. The rental car company had canceled my reservation and the Marriott had saved its only unremodeled room for me minus the baseboards. Normally, I would have wallowed in privileged white person self-pity as I lay down to sleep in my icky traveling clothes, but I didn't do that 
because an epiphany in the Denver airport had changed my day. For as I was looking around at the anger and exasperation and disappointment and confusion of the thousands like me, I felt like I was looking at a microcosm of the past 18 months, as well as the future picture of a pandemic that is far from over. And as I took in the utter chaos swirling around me, I was very startled to hear these words form in my brain. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I had never prayed the serenity prayer in my entire life, largely because I strongly prefer spontaneous prayers to formulaic prayers. But a weird sense of peace settled over me in the airport as I prayed this prayer that I had avoided for decades. And as I kept on praying it, the words and the feelings not only helped me navigate the rest of the day, but they also created a space for me to think more clearly about the prayer's key concept, wisdom. All spiritual traditions have produced wisdom literature, and within our own Judeo-Christian tradition, Biblical scholars commonly refer to Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon as the primary books of wisdom. I've chosen today to focus on chapter eight of the book of Proverbs because it paints a compelling picture of wisdom not found in other parts of the Bible. As a woman who was God's first creation, who participated in drawing up blueprints for the universe, and who is urgently summoning us to hear her voice everywhere we go. Several years ago, when I first read a scholarly commentary about this passage in the Hebrew scriptures, I had to laugh when the author referred to it as the, the chapter about Mrs. God. And then, of course, I immediately wondered why they hadn't taught this in my Southern Baptist Sunday School, as if I don't know the answer to that question. Like many books of the Bible, the book of Proverbs has proven hard to nail down with regard to dates of origin, historical context, cultural and literary influences, accuracy of translation over the centuries, and authorship itself. Although the book begins with the words, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, most scholars believe that this epigraph is only an honorary nod to the fabled wisdom of Solomon, and that much of the book of Proverbs was written by the court and temple-based men who served as counselors, bureaucrats, and teachers during the reign of Solomon in the 10th century BC. In other words, intellectually elite males in a strongly male-centered society which makes the personification of wisdom as a woman especially intriguing. A woman who has a loud voice and is not afraid to raise it in the public square, who was God's first creation, a master worker alongside the creator, a woman who is to be listened to, reckoned with, believed, and obeyed. So what I want us to do today is to think together about wisdom and specifically about three aspects of it. First, what is it? Second, where do we find it? And third, what happens to us when we open ourselves to receiving it? This closer look at wisdom seems to me to be especially necessary for us as we travel through this liminal time of re-engaging with each other as individuals, as members of the social order, and as a congregation. Most contemporary dictionaries define wisdom as the application of knowledge, experience, and good judgment to actions or decisions. The book of Proverbs is generally in accord with this, but also adds the components of discipline, deliberate departure from evil, and listening to advice from those with more experience. One thing I always do when I'm preparing a sermon 
is to check out many different translations of the scripture on the website BibleGateway.com. I recently did this with the word wisdom in Proverbs, and chapter 9 yielded a new favorite in Eugene Peterson's Message Bible, where he translates wisdom as skilled living. I really like that. Wisdom is skilled living. So how do we as people of faith acquire an ability for the skilled living that is the expression of wisdom? According to Proverbs, wisdom begins with the fear of God, a term that was very unsettling for me during my punitive and hyper-religious upbringing. I was taught that God is my friend, but I didn't fear the few friends I had. And then there was that Bible verse about how perfect love casts out fear, but there were also those folks who said they loved me, but then often threatened to put the fear of God in me. These mixed messages continued to confuse me until I was in college, when a professor who was equal parts intelligence and kindness explained to our Christian ethics class that unless you believe in a vengeful and punishing God, the fear of God can best be understood as awe and reverence. I do have that approach to the far greater than I mystery that I call God. And I believe that whatever each of us holds in awe and reverence or considers to be our spiritual resources are the most fertile places to begin our search for the definition and evolving meaning of skilled living in these days. Equally important, as I keep on discovering, is that the availability of wisdom is not limited to our own or any other faith tradition. Woman wisdom assures us in Proverbs that hanging out with her leads to God knowledge. But our own commitment to genuine religious pluralism has taught us that wisdom does not lie just within the God of the Judeo-Christian tradition, and that it's found in abundance in indigenous religions, in Hinduism, in Shinto, in Islam, in theophilosophies such as Buddhism and Confucianism, and in secular humanism. After March 10th of last year, I was angry and unsettled for several months, but once I came to peace with the idea of being in a strange city without a job during a pandemic that had no foreseeable end, I got excited about not setting an alarm, wearing jeans and sweatshirts every day, and reading only what I wanted for as many hours as I, as I wanted. Police procedurals, poetry, physics for dummies. <laughs> but as I assembled an extensive reading list, it just didn't seem very satisfying. And I slowly but surely realized that my greatest hunger was for books that would give me wisdom. A whole new reading list emerged, and thanks to books such as the Quran, Braiding Sweetgrass, Aging with Wisdom, and Holy Envy, subtitled Finding God in the Faith of Others, I ended 2020 with a soul more nourished by wisdom than ever before. Given that wisdom is everywhere, let's consider what happens to us when we seek it from all sources, and not only from the great literature or from recognized wisdom traditions. Once I started looking for wisdom, which was about 25 years ago, it appeared to me everywhere. And I've been greatly blessed to hear profound wisdom from children, from the elderly, from complete strangers, from people who are marginalized socially and economically, and from those who have been labeled emotionally or mentally ill. Best of all, when we recognize, receive, and incorporate the wisdom of others, we, like the woman in Proverbs, become the blueprint makers and architects of a new creation that we establish in holy partnership with the divine. 
I saw this happening on Thursday during the weekly lunch and lectionary meeting where we were considering the scripture for today. I wish I had thought to simply record that Zoom meeting and play it for you today as the spontaneous sermon that it was, filled with wisdom from every person there, from Marlene and Bob and Pam and Paul and Martha and Larry and Cheryl and Terry and John. What wonderful gifts reside in this congregation. Every week I receive about a dozen newsletters from churches where I've pastored or preached over the past seven years. And I'm astonished by how many of them talk about how great it will be to return to normal. I don't expect any of them to throw out the baby with the baptism or to chuck off everything they were doing before. But I'm surprised at how few of them talk about changes they want to make. In stark contrast to this was Park Hill's recent congregational meeting on July 18th. The moderator, Pam Hennessy, began by saying that as we made our way through the pandemic and are emerging from it, quote, we felt like we were heading in the right direction, but who knows, end of quote. And she made reference to the cloud of unknowing, an anonymous work of Christian mysticism written in the late 14th century. Those in attendance at the meeting were filled with enthusiasm for Park Hill 2.0, for continuation of new ways that leadership has found to draw the circle wider during the past 18 months, and for creating many possibilities for increasing our social justice work and knowing each other's hearts and souls more deeply. As the meeting unfolded, it was clear to me that you are a people intent on going forward in passion, in curiosity and wonder, and in wisdom. As someone who has seen several congregations flounder and basically stall out for want of a vision to reimagine themselves, I was profoundly encouraged by the creativity I witnessed at the meeting on July 18th. As I get older, I think more and more about the larger ramifications of concepts that were once very circumscribed by my spiritual immaturity and lack of life experience. Three of those concepts that have expanded greatly for me are love, gratitude, and wisdom. And I've come to believe that each one of them contains the element of responsibility. Love comes with the responsibility of giving it unconditionally. Gratitude carries the responsibility of sharing generously. And wisdom bears the responsibility of growing the courage to act on it. Or as the serenity prayer says, to change the things that we can. In other words, wisdom without a forward dynamic toward courageous action is just a lovely form of philosophical knowledge. This is the second Sunday when services in the sanctuary have been open without a limit on the number of people who can attend. And it's a great temptation for us to be euphoric, to turn our attention exclusively to the joy of being together again, and to imagine ways that we can know each other more deeply than we did before the pandemic. But we have equally important and outward-looking responsibilities toward the overlapping communities of which we are a part, to Park Hill, to Denver, and to the wide world. I long ago concluded that very few people go to religious services because of the sermons. That was a great relief to me. (laughs) Instead, most of us go for relational reasons. Because we found common ground with others who share our longings and visions for a world that turns on justice and peace and inclusion, rather than on greed and lies and polarization. And it's that very commonality that should lead us to simultaneously broaden our service to those who continue to suffer. To put it another way, The time that we spend together should strengthen us to spend an equal amount of time serving others beyond ourselves. 
And as we endeavor to be followers of Jesus, the radical Jewish rabbi, I'm reminded every day that he spent his entire ministry not on paying attention to bourgeois folks like me, but in seeing and meeting the elemental needs of the least of these. As I try to imagine what Park Hill might become as we move forward, I return to two pieces of wisdom that have helped me when I've gotten to important junctures in my life. One from Polish-American scholar Alfred Kozyski, and the other from Spanish poet Antonio Machado. The first piece of wisdom is, the map is not the territory. All of us completely understand this because not one of us has followed the map we were handed as children, or even the many maps we later crafted for ourselves as we ventured into the territory of maturity and adult living. The second piece of wisdom is we make the path by walking, which seems especially important for us today as we try to decide as individuals, social beings, and a congregation how we want to engage in skill living after the tumultuous experiences of the last year and a half. As I try to gather the lessons and wisdom from the past 18 months, I think that if nothing else, the pandemic continues to throw into ever higher relief the vast inequities and injustices that exist in our country and in others, as well as the fact that although we are all in this turbulent sea together, a few of us are sailing on luxury cruise ships while most of us are clinging fearfully to random pieces of driftwood. The wisdom to be gotten from this gut-wrenching picture is that life is a short embrace filled with uncertainty and that we are being called to redefine and practice skilled living with all the joy and courage we can find with each other, equaled by all the service we can give to others in partnership with God. As I stand here right now, I am strangely excited to be walking mapless with you as we make a path through unknown territory together, committed to collaborating with divine wisdom and acting with courage to change what we can. I thank you for the hope and courage you give me, and I thank God for all of you. Grace to you and peace.